my screen and just show a start page. Uh, meanwhile, so I am a uh, web developer and IT consultant. Uh, I've been working for the last 15 years quite intensely with CMSs in .NET uh, specifically. So I have actually felt a lot of pain points. I, I came to the conclusion or the realization that uh, I more or less start each, each assi assignment by doing the same things over and over. Uh, and I think that a lot of the, the current CMSs are not really optimal for the way of working that we have today in .NET. Um, so for example, you as uh, I assume .NET developers are, uh, you know, you have been blessed with the type safety of .NET, right? Uh, and uh, really a lot of CMSs don't take advantage of this. I would say, uh, and I think that there's a better way. Um, so I, I would say that Cloud ECMS builds upon two core tenets or principles. Uh, the first one is that the code is really king or queen or, or how, however you can uh, put that. Really that you need the developer to code the website. I don't believe, we, or rather we reject the concept of a website that doesn't require a developer. Uh, that's, you know, that that's not something we believe in. Uh, Cloud ECMS is very much a development intensive uh, system because that is the best way of working. So I will give you an example, which is the content data model of the CMSs, uh, which is, for example, your page types and your properties. Um, if you have worked with EpiServer, for example, you will know that before version seven, yeah, before version seven, the data type uh, or the, the content model was saved in the database. So if you created new properties or new page types, then if you deploy from your test development to your staging environment, for example, uh, that will mean that you need to deploy the code and you also need to deploy the database. And that is really actually problematic because you as a developer don't want to deal with the actual data. You're responsible for the logic, right? And the, and the structures. So I believe that as you develop, if you have, let's say four environments, so let's say you have development, testing, staging and production or, or something similar, your code will actually bubble up. So it will begin in, in the development environment. It will progress to the testing environment, then to the staging or QA environment, and then to the production environment. But the data actually will bubble down. So you will actually backstage the production environment to the staging environment. And then you will copy that eventually to this testing environment to have you know, representable uh, data to test against. And then you will copy that to the development environment. Um, and that kind of clashes uh, if you're having a directional flow from the database from production to the de de development, then you can't have changes that need to go the other way because then you will have to solve that problem somehow. Uh, thankfully, Episode solved this in uh, version seven when they uh, incorporated the the page type uh, the um, the page type builder, you know, uh, plain old C sharp classes uh, to define their uh, page types or content types. So that's a really good design decision, I think. And uh, that's one that we uh, copied, uh, to be honest. And that, that's really the first core principle of, the, of Cloud ECMS, that the developer and the code is, is what we should be dealing with, not data, right? The second thing is that the, the CMS shouldn't try to overreach, or it shouldn't overreach at all, actually. So. If you take, again, EpiServer, even Obraco or, or Piranha CMS, they more or less have their own database solution. You know, So uh, EpiServer has their own like kind of document database implemented in a relational database. So you can't really change database uh, technology. You can't use MySQL, for example. That would be just plain impossible because it's hard coded. Uh, the user login system, it's hard, it's hard coded. I mean, the uh, not the login system, but the user administration system, it's just hard coded into the system, uh, into server. So it really, it does a little 
too much, I would say. Um, and I think, I think I will give you a refreshing uh, perspective uh, by, by demonstrating how a simple website is built in, in Cloudy CMS. So this presentation will be maybe 15, 20 minutes, and then we can take uh, questions and answers if you, uh, if you have any, uh, or, or discussion, plain and simple. So let me show you a, an empty .NET application. This has nothing uh, special, really. Um, I only prepped it by uh, this, uh, just adding a user secret. Uh, so I have that ready. Don't need to enter any credentials uh, on screen. So let's start this up. And it runs hello world. Uh, to just zoom in a bit. Yeah, exactly. So that is uh, the default route here. So let's go ahead and install Entity Framework uh, because that is what we use. So let me show you how this is actually kind of different from from other CMSs. So we install NPT Framework Core. And we will be using uh, an in-memory database, meaning we don't need to specify a real database, but um, it will actually, it will clear every time we build, it will clear. That's gonna get old really fast, but, but let's, just, uh, let's just start with this. I mean, it's, it's good for development in some, in a sense, it's good to get off, off the ground quickly. So that is installed. Uh, let me create a folder called models. I'm gonna add a context. This is a normal entity framework context. And the thing is the, the nice, the nice part about this is that you're using you're using standard components. You're not using, you know, web servers on Rocco's, you know, totally custom way of accessing your data. So let's call that options. Just that. Mm -hmm. all right. That's it. I'll add the. Uh, configuration for that. So far so good. It's still running. Get the check, sanity check. And um, right, let's go ahead and install Cloud ECMS. So we'll go to NuGet packages. We have Cloud ECMS here. That is just a thin layer upon over uh, Entity Framework to bring in like a kind of a meta model. And then we have the UI portion, which is a, the actual admin area, so to speak. Uh, we'll actually also install the media picker. Let's do that right now, actually. So, okay, that's installed. We can see in the project file here that we installed three additional um, packages. Uh, in addition to entity framework and in memory database support. Uh, let's go ahead and add Cloudy. Right, and here we have Cloudy. We should add the actual admin interface and we will not require any login right now, which will yield a warning. And we will also we 
we'll add a context, which is the context I created for Entity Framework. And I'll also go ahead and add the Azure Media Picker, uh, which I'm going to demonstrate a bit later. All right. That's, hope that's simple enough. And we shall start using Razor Pages and controllers. That's it. Let's zoom out a bit. Mm, right, we need static files as well. Static files, static functions. And this is instead of adding a cache buster to each URL. Right, right. So now we have the empty clean slate cloudy admin interface, right? Um, actually, what, what we are doing here, when, when you're working with uh, EF Core, you're probably building a custom application or a very simple website, right? Um, how are you going to administrate? How are you going to administrate that data? How are you going to edit and uh, you know create, insert and delete that data? Um, you're probably going to create your own little CMS, uh, or you're going to auto-generate it with uh, help of the Visual Studio, uh, the EF Core tools, right? And that will essentially result in possibly hundreds of files uh, with really, uh, there's so much repetition and um, the, the error margin is just too high that I, I find it quite uh, you know inhuman to work like that. So let me show you how it's done with Cloudy. So this is just a class called page. I will add that to my context. Page. Oh. Good. It should have a, an ID, a name, description. Okay. Let's see. And that actually worked. It took the class name and it pluralizes that. So it adds S to that, which is kind of nice. And uh, let's create a new page. And the thing is, if I create a start page now, I can save that. And this is actually the, the, the main heading of, this, of the edit page, right? So it uses one, which is the ID. It doesn't really realize that you have something called name that, is using, that, that it's supposed to be using for naming this page. So I, we actually have an, an interface for this, which is called nameable. And now you're going to see why I told you that in-memory databases get old real fast because now it cannot find the instance I created because I made a change, I compiled, and now the in-memory database is cleared. So I need to create that again. So now we can see that it realized that actually we have a name for these, these things. We could probably create a convention for this, but uh, right now it's just an interface, right? Um, so that's all well. Let's actually make this possible to uh, to browse to browse to. So it's supposed to be iRoutable then, and we need a URL segment, okay, which will give us a text uh, text field here, and we need to create a route for that. So let's create a route controller route, page controller, route. and here we shall, well, you need to capture the segment, right? So if, if the page has start as its URL segment, that should be captured 
and then translate it into. So yeah, it, let's create a route and it is a content route. And we will route that to a controller, a page controller. Action, yes, actually. And then, I hope that this is, uh, you know, if one wouldn't know, if you wouldn't know .NET, then you would be like, why are you doing all this work? I mean, this is all very strange, but as a .NET developer, this is basically how you, this is how you work, right? So we have the page controller. If I create, and right, it will actually complain that I don't have that view. So let's go and create a view as well inside the page folder because it's the page controller and then an index. Mm -hmm. Hold on. View. Um, right. Let's see. Now, if I write hello here, uh, start page here. I have a view button here actually because Cloudy searches your, it scans your routes. Your route collection is actually scanned by Cloudy. So if you create a route for this, then yeah, it'll, it'll just help you and try to be a smart, you know? So, okay, so that works. How can I actually get access to this? So let me just go back here because I will need to create the start page again when I change. So the page controller, we have the word hello in the URL, right? That is captured by the con content route. So here we should be able to get the page. And I actually need to say that this is from content route like that. Uh, it's pretty simple. And then I add the page here and then I can define the model to be a page. Oops. it let's do this again start page hello and then view yeah you see so this is pretty cool actually i i, I kind of like this because um there was a question uh before the uh, the presentation that like what what's the difference between piranha cms and cloudy well in Piranha CMS, you don't actually see EF Core. It's it's using EF uh, it's using EF Core internally, but it's not. I mean, you're not using EF Core, right? So that's what I dislike about it. I mean, I mean, it's it's fine as a CMS and, and, and all, but this is really much more closer to the metal, uh, to use a buzzword, right? Um, you also have another thing. So let's let's actually add a footer here. Um, and here I want the company name. Uh, sorry. Company name. So you're, I, I'm sure you all use um, settings pages. And there's actually something I have thought of here that we're, we're all just creating a bunch of site settings all the time. So let's, let's actually go ahead and create a site settings entity site settings like that it needs an id and it needs a copyright and i didn't add name because that's not necessary if i need a name then I, then i can add that but now i'm actually gonna implement the interface called singleton. And I think that's it actually. So let's see, now we have the site settings and this is a singleton meaning it's, it's a very simple interface that, but it's kind of it's kind of nice conceptually because this means that you can't list site settings. You're only allowed to create one. 
so my company is here like that. I'll create a new page because it's disappeared because I'm using the in-memory database. And hello, like that, and view. And all right, I need to change here. Right, and here I need that those site settings. So I would actually like to in the future inject them through um, dependency injection, but right now what you need to do is you get your get required service single ton getter get site settings and then I need to avoid it. Okay. And we will have to create this again. So the start page and the site settings need to be created. My company. All right. And we go to the page again here. View. And it works. This is kind of nice, actually. So it, it, it kind of like elevates the, uh, the importance of the concept of singleton entities, meaning site settings. Uh, so any site, any settings or anything that actually should only ever exist at one single entity, you can, you can um, inherit that uh, interface. There's another thing as well. So let's say that your page has a, a contact card, like a contact person. So let's go ahead and create a contact person. Contact person, All right? Let's create an ID for that person, a name for that person, and uh, well, okay, an address as well. But really, what I want is an image. Okay, so that person is nameable, but it's also im imageable so that's pretty cool that that means that it's going to use this property as an image when showing you when when you know when when showing you the the admin area and this is going to be a media picker uh, property actually let's go ahead and have a um, information property and make that a html property and we add that to the context as well. Right. And also, we're actually going to be picking for each page, we're going to have a contact person. So we are going to use a select for that for the type of contact person. Let's try that. Okay, so I need to recreate everything. Okay, so yeah, okay, good. So the site settings, create the site settings, the page, uh, let's create the contact person. So let's create a new contact person, John Dillon, an image, and this is the media picker. It's uh, connected directly to a blob storage in Azure. Uh, obviously a lot of cats. Uh, this is also a good property to have uh, on the site settings, by the way, if you need a logo type, for example, or anything like that. Uh, and it's the, the nice thing about this is it's a string property. What is being saved in your database is a string, nothing else. Um, so that's, um, I, I really think that this is kind of, you know, almost to the point of being graceful. So let's say that. And let's create a page again, start page, hello, and the contact person. So now this list actually recognizes that we are listing uh, an entity of that is implementing the imageable and nameable interface. So 
it'll actually use that data to show you. It it, it kind of adjusts the uh, the experience uh, for you based on that. So that's that's kind of I think it's kind of useful. Um, this is basically it. We have one feature that's really cool, but it's not really it's not live yet, which is actually um, blocks. It's blocks. Uh, we'll sh just show you in real quick how that's uh, working. So blocks is basically you know a class that you want to refer to. Uh, so we have a page here. Um, here. So the front page block. Maybe maybe we want, we want a hero block or something. It you don't you can you can refer to it directly. But here I have an interface that actually is implemented by two classes. I don't know if I'm making any sense, but there could be two different classes that actually uh, are actually used uh, here. So that will actually look like this. This is the front page block. And when you add it, it will know, it, it kind of scans your type hierarchy and sees that, okay, these two classes actually implement this interface. And then you can, you know, can switch between them. We're also launching this pretty, um, pretty powerful um, um, undo well history state manager as well. So, so there's. I think I would dare to say there's not lots of interesting things coming up. But um, interested to hear what you guys have to say. I think that's it. Please uh, tell me any questions you have. There was one question about the market share about the CMSs. I do have a an idea of that, but not really. I don't have any numbers. If there's any other uh, questions, perhaps. You can write in the chat, perhaps. Kevin. How to easily support staging and prod? So David had a question. Uh, well, really, it's supposed to be we're, we're, you know, it's kind of what they say in that song. You know, we're we're bringing it back. You know, where this is basically 100% standard .NET development. You're really not using Cloudy. You're using EF Core. So how are you supporting staging and production in EF Core? That's how you should, how, how you're supposed to be thinking. There's no surprises here, really. Uh, we're not storing your data in any strange way. We're not we're not actually involved at all in how you store your data. Uh, there's just a few support classes in the front end uh, to get singletons and stuff. So really, that challenge is on changed you know how you're solving it today is how you probably should be solving it with cloudy uh, we're really bringing the uh, the admin interface and a little bit of utility uh, in your front end um, supporting staging and prod bit of an open-ended question i think uh, but you know in ef core you have these migrations you have seeding uh, you have um, you obviously uh, perhaps do backstaging of uh, databases before you go to staging. Uh, that might be it. Um, so yeah, uh, please please type any questions you have uh, and, and uh, thoughts and opinions um, and feedback. Um, maybe something that could be improved with my probably with my presentation. No slides, for example. I don't know if that's a good thing. Um, or, or a bad thing. Ah, yes, this is a very good question. So Alex said, is it possible to implement custom controls, for example, some fancy gallery and import and install custom controls via NuGet packages that you did with the media picker? Yes, that is absolutely possible. Right now, well, in the in the currently live version, we're using a plain old ASP.NET. So you use a UI hint to uh, actually show that. Um, 
did with the HTML control. Let me show my screen again real quick. Uh, so basically, we're not doing anything fancy with the HTML control, for example. Here, you see. Uh, it's just a plain old UI hint, which will actually uh, get a let, let's actually go ahead and change this to, uh, to something else. So we'll see. Uh, so here it is. New page. No, this is the uh, this is the content version. Yeah. So my custom control. So if I change that, I will get an error here because it's trying to load the CHH. Uh, I mean the razor file, the partial, from these different locations. So it is. Uh, I, I, it, it's completely customizable, but r right now we're actually doing a rebuild of this uh, into a dynamic um, um, front end. So Razor is fine, but with large uh, models and uh, also if you want to support some kind of dynamism like uh, tabs and stuff, uh, you need a bit of power. So we're actually using Preact to uh, create the controls in the future, which is also totally customizable because we don't really use a build system in the front end. So we'll, you will be able to create any control you want, really. Right, the license. Um, so it is actually, it's open source, but we don't plan on making it free of charge for real commercial use. Uh, so for personal use, it's free. Non-commercial use and open source is free. Uh, we will be having uh, pricing for commercial use. Uh, it is available on the website, but it's uh, a little bit in flux, but that's uh, it is here. Uh, that is something I really uh, dislike with, uh, you know, the, the best development experience is in, in the current state, of the .NET landscape is EpiServer. You know, it has the best development experience because it's code first. Um, but they charge. You know, they charge. They're really good at one thing that's charging. I mean, what what is it, like four thousand dollars per month maybe uh, for a production instance. So it's uh, yeah, it's not feasible. So this is what we're charging right now. But um, really curious to hear your opinions about this. 